Welcome to the herd and thanks for listening. If you enjoy this sodcast, please like it, share it, give it a good rating and follow and help more people find their way into the Ruminati herd. If you have suggestions for improvements, please let me know. Howdy, everybody. Welcome to this episode of the Meet Your Herdmates Sodcast. Our guest today is Carl Stafford. Carl is a livestock forage extension agent uh, with the Virginia Extension Service from Culpepper. Is that right? Correct. Okay. Yep. <laughs> Help me, Carl. Uh, <laughs> that's fine. Um, good. Um, Carl and I have known each other for a few years. We're not going to get into exactly how many that might be. Um, but for people who don't know where Culpeper, Virginia is, or Culpeper County, is that right? Mm hmm. Where is that located? So it's between Charlottesville and Washington, D.C., about 40 miles north of Charlottesville, located in the northern Piedmont of Virginia. And uh, it's got a location. If you get a map out, you'll find Culpeper real quick. It's got the maps go out, of, the roads go out of Culpeper like, like a spider web, uh, like a wagon wheel spokes. So sort of in that northern bulge of Virginia that... That's right. Uh, and It'll end up being our curse. I think you get to that in some of your questions later, but our location... It uh, might doom us. It's the reason the Civil War spent more time here than anywhere else in the United States, and it might be the reason that Culpeper, Culpeper's ag uh, may not have but a few generations left. Who knows? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yes, we will get to that because I think that's really important for people to have that perspective. But first of all, a little bit more about you. Um, did, were you born on a farm? Did you grow up in that area? How did you get to where you are right now? I was raised on a farm, um, born to a set of parents that were busy getting some advanced degrees. And we traveled a few states doing that and ended up in Floyd County, Virginia, five children and enough people to take care of all the critters that my mother thought we ought to have and, and eat at while we were doing it and milking a cow and th those sort of things. So you know, the boots were lined up on the back porch and everybody had a job to do before breakfast and at the end of the day as well. And my grandparents, uh, both on my mother's and father's side, were farmers. And the time I spent with them, I think, cemented my interest in, in agriculture. And so that's a, a small description of my interest and my motivation. I, I was growing little gardens when I was a kid. I don't know why I was interested in doing that sort of thing. So... Um, and so where did you go to school? Uh, Berea College. Uh, I know when you interviewed uh, our Mr. Jim Garrish, you wanted to pin that on him, but uh, you were <laughs> thinking of me, I expect. So Berea, one of those fine little schools, you know, they were on a list of institutions to be paying taxes on their endowment. And when they realized that they spent most of the growth of their endowment on their students, they took them off that list. So they've got a lot of endowment money. Um, their total net worth is more north of a billion dollars, but uh, they spend their endowment on the student's cost of education. So you can't get in if you can pay, uh, oh. Peter. And so usually yeah. the, it's, it's a one generation deal that the kids, my children couldn't get in because we're, uh, we're too well off. Hmm. Well, what a novel idea that you would use your endowment to benefit students of an institution of higher education. That's remarkable. Here, Princeton um, has followed that example. They've decided about 25% of their endowment ought to do the same thing, or 25% of their students ought to be those that can't afford to pay. Okay. So it's, yeah. uh, their, their awareness might be rising. I'm not sure. Uh, so from Berea, to extension service. What's the, the journey there? Yeah, I've, I've really only had two real jobs, uh, you know, a, a, a paycheck kind of job. Uh, taught school for almost two years, ag vocational agriculture. And if I'd had children in school at the time, they would have qualified for reduced lunches. I was making $14,000 on a 12-year contract. And I think that was in the neighborhood of about what reduced lunches would be. But anyway, uh, no children at that 
time that we're in school. But uh, extension had biggest raise I ever got was when I started with extension and I've been in this same job in the same county in the same building ever since. So some 35 years. Mm. And uh, anyway, that's mm. one of the top counties in the state at the time. And uh, the least uh, likely place for me to get a job in Berea made a difference because everybody else was Virginia Tech. Okay, great school, but I was different. And uh, it later became clear that they did make a good decision. But uh, anyway. Um, so how did you, was your interest in forage agriculture from growing up or did you pick that up somewhere along the line yeah. before or after you joined the extension service? I'll have to give the dairy industry credit for my growing and cemented understanding of what forages can do for livestock. And Jerry Swisher, retired county agent in Augusta County, was the, the mentor and the example. And so in the in the early 90s, dairies in this area, this is a dairy county and dairy farmers founded Culpeper. And it's one of those stories that's a sad ending that they're about over with. They're not big enough, but they founded this community. And so the farmers were looking for ways to do better, be more profitable. They either had to grow or they had to look at a cheaper way of doing it. Or And the grazing part would do that. And, and uh, so learned about grazing by watching dairy cows make milk from it and what kind of grass it took to do that and the management it took to do it in the plant uh, quality and uh, the fencing and the systems and it's very intense. And um, so from that, it's, it's, it's like falling off a log to feed beef cattle that way. But if you can, if you can do it with dairy cattle, you can do it with anything. Hmm. So this is now, if I'm doing the math right, mid eighties that you're starting an extension and and that you've been looking at grazing management, forage management in dairy animals in, in that part of the world. Yeah, and, and doing it for 25, going on 30 years, uh, the dairy part, and then began to look at how beef cattle producers manage their grass and wondered about, you know, what did we do when we didn't have all this equipment? We didn't feed very much hay. It was the labor intensive part. Mm -hmm. um, so began to investigate it and learn about it and met an old economics driven farm manager here in Culpeper. And I learned from him that he'd been grazing fescue for years and nobody ever talked about it. 15 mm -hmm. years, he said he didn't feed any hay. Well, so anyhow, that was learning about how we could winter graze. The dairy part was mostly grazing during the growing season, the really good high quality stuff. We didn't think about winter grazing, but today's emphasis for my purposes is about, you, you manage grazing year round, but the winter is, is where the, that's where the money's made is in the winter time, because that's where the cost is. Okay, so the, the, the cost of those supplemental feeds. And, how much of the dairying was seasonal versus 365 day kind of delivery? Almost none. The, the milk plants, the milk co-ops struggled with seasonal. They, their permit was predicated on a year round supply. And I think that discouraged a lot of people from doing seasonal. There, there ended up some 20 years later from the beginning of that dairy grazing management, a, uh, an organic herd that, that went seasonal. And so it, it was, uh, seasonal was not a majority of it by any means. Uh, in fact, it was uncommon. And people uh, struggled with the cash flow. They, they would spread your nine or 10 months of seasonal milk out over 12 months, but not many people did it. And uh, it, was, it was actually very challenging to get all those cows to calve in a small window of time and to meet to match up with the forage supply, but that was the idea of seasonal dairy. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, in that milk shed, the dairy was primarily fluid milk or manufacturing? So um, that's a very astute point that you're making there and you know where, what happens to the milk. And so if we go south, I'm avoiding answering you directly, 
if we go into Florida, it's almost all fluid. And so Florida and the hot Southern states, that's the holy grail of selling milk. Let's sell it into Florida. It's pretty valuable there. Fluid milk consumption is the number one value. And so uh, Virginia is, is in a transition state. And so a lot of our milk would go fluid when the demand was high and when it wasn't, then the, the milk co-ops had ways to deal with it. They had balancing plants. They would make powder and they would make other products at, at, of their several plants. So they would deal with when there was an extra amount beyond the fluid needs, they, they would deal with it. Mm. So uh, anyway, it depended on the time of year, how much of it went for fluid consumption. And, and now it, it, my impression from what you've said so far is that the grazing sort of extended the life of dairying in your part of the state, but that it's even now there are pressures against it that are leading to perhaps ultimately the end of dairying in your part of the, the country. It, it, it extended it for those who were seeking a, a better way forward. Not all of them did that, but it, for those that did it, I think it gave them more years, but eventually the, the scale of national dairies caught up with them and they, they didn't have scale. So they, they still had to go out of business. And it was very disappointing to watch those that had built these grazing dairies to, to quit. But the economics said even that couldn't keep working. Hmm. So, so what are the problems that dairy specifically, or then um, we could extend it to other ruminant animal agriculture faces in, in your part of the state? We're just not big enough. It's, it's a margin business. And so, you know, the very best, the very, I don't know if the best is the right term, but biggest businesses spread their costs, their fixed costs across the maximum number of units. And so even if it's a small margin, it's still a lot of little margins make for profit. So uh, it is a, a margin business and sometimes they're, they're negative. And uh, still, we, we're just never, we're big enough. So today's example is thousands of cows in units spread across the landscape to have the production of feeds nearby them. And anyway, we're just not big enough. and. The, the history of dairying in my area is that chapter is just about closed. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and given where you're located, I would imagine that there's development pressure against uh, agriculture or agriculture suburban kind of interfaces that can cause problems. It can, and it, it so it's a problem and it's actually an asset too. So, you know, we've watched when I first started, we had less than 500 farms and now we're well over 600, but we've got less farm land. So we're dividing big farms into smaller farms is what it says to me. And uh, we're building houses on land that's zoned for it. And so while it's, it's negative against agriculture for those that have small inefficient operations, they've got agritourism. And so visitation is, um, is quite, an advantage over so if you've got a building and you put animals in it versus putting people in it mm -hmm. it's a whole lot better to have people in that barn than it is animals <laughs> so say we we gather for a wedding or for some experience and um, people pay and animals pay too but they have there's it's much smaller payment mm. I just had visions of of trying to get people into a stanchion <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not sure that would work yeah um uh, well, there's, there are many little dairy barns that have been converted. Hmm. So we've got, you know, more, we've got hundreds of them. And uh, what do we do with them today? Well, they're kind of single use buildings. So they lend themselves to opening up and having indoor spaces that are, oh, isn't that nice? And see the rafters and have a, in fact, there's a big dairy barn at uh, Sperryville, Virginia, and it's only used for weddings. Hmm. Well, a lot of those buildings are old enough to have the timber construction and, yep. and that aesthetic value. Yes, very attractive. Um, 
not necessarily efficient for dairying today, no. but um, and and that unfortunately sometimes is the con conflict between our romantic perception and the hard economic reality today. Um, I've heard something about in Virginia the the pressure for de of development against the value of farmland. And, and how to allow land to remain in agriculture. Um, and so there are, I guess, some trusts or easements that are, are part of what some people are doing to try to maintain farmland as farmland. Absolutely. Virginia's got one of the, one of the best uh, systems of preserving farmland in the country. And it's, uh, tax credits or what are generated. So it's all about the difference between what it is before the easement and what it is after the easement, the value. And so that difference is where the tax credits come into play. And even if you don't have the income to offset tax credits, you can sell them on a market at, at a discount. But uh, yeah, so we have a lot of easements and I guess, I don't know who those people are, but probably people that are they understand complicated things and they have foresight and they believe in this piece of land that they built. I know a farmer, actually he was my father's chemistry teacher. He built this farm and he was a dairy farmer and John Boldridge. And he said, I'm gonna preserve this farm. He put an easement on it. He, he preserved what he built. And so it'll be forever that way. Well, I, I grew up in lower Bucks County, Pennsylvania, just sort of northwest suburbs of, of Philadelphia. And lower Bucks County was sort of the, the breadbasket of Philadelphia and lots and lots of this, you know, farms that during the course of my childhood were converted into um, housing developments. And, and so the, that process went on and then people were trying to still farm to a certain degree, but it's very difficult to do that with equipment in a suburban environment. And, um, and, and there are other issues that, that, as I said, result in challenges with, with neighbors. Um, and, and I guess part of this effort that you've described could help people understand why there's value in maintaining farmland as farmland rather than the, the especially in forages. So farmers, they pay more taxes than they cost in services. So they're, they're subsidizing homeowners in a very simple way. They pay a dollar in taxes and they get in my area 30 or 40 cents in services. So there's a 60 or 70 cent subsidy to the rest that don't pay enough tax. Now, homeowners will, will, will fuss and holler that their taxes are too high, but they'd be higher. Look for the highest taxes in Virginia and you'll have the least farmers. Now that doesn't, that implies the farmers are the only reason. Business and industry also pays more taxes than they cost in services. It all boils down to schools or 60, 80% of a lot of county budgets. So it, it boils down to the cost of schools and then roads and libraries and police and fire and rescue and, and all the other things that, that local and state governments pay for. So agriculture, if you keep a farm, you keep that person paying taxes and you don't have to shift the tax burden that they were carrying onto those who remain after the farm is gone. So keep your farms and they'll keep paying taxes even if they have land use taxation, which is a reduction in taxes, they still pay more tax than they cost in services. So. And in addition to that, we could think about things like watershed health and water quality issues, which there's this incredibly large area called the Chesapeake Bay drainage, which I was surprised to realize goes all the way to New York State. Yep. Um, and so a lot of interest has been on water quality in, in that drainage. Yeah, so grazing livestock can often be found to have a positive impact on on water in, in their watershed. Uh, and and we, we often presume that, that a farm would generate problems. So there was a study in the Fauquier County, neighboring county to Culpeper, and there was a, a split uh, watershed 
the stream had two forks. The fork that came out of the woods had more E. coli bacteria than the fork that came through farmland. They were they were dumbfounded by that finding, and I use it over and over and over again. Wildlife. Mm -hmm. um, there was there was E. coli in the clam beds off off the eastern shore of Virginia. It had to be people. They thought it's got to be the people failing septic. It was it was small mammals in the marshes which flush twice a day. Mm. Uh, so it's what we assume. We need to measure and, and look for facts, and that's. That's what extension is all about. So a good trusted source will be somebody that deals in facts. Mm. And so the extension service, just uh, uh, I, sorry, I, I used to be one and uh, I, I have a soft spot, a spot in my heart for that mission. Um, what is the extension service? What's the roots of that service and who can access it and where is it in, in the United States? In every state and in every county in the United States, with maybe with some exceptions, but accessible by everybody. I give cards to people. I say, I work for everybody. Here's my card. And, you know, we, we are we're connected to the land grant universities. They're across the whole country and they do work that's based on fact we disseminate those facts out to the people based on their need and their request and and local offices are all different everybody's every, every county can be different so we might have dairy in one county and uh, forestry in another as a dominant source of uh, land generated income so there are differences in every community and we're obligated as extension workers to uh, find out those differences to have grassroots input on our work and uh, address the needs that people say are important to them. And and to that point, it's it's meant to be a two way communication yes. from land grant university and then back to the land grant that, university about research right. needs and yep. program needs. We need this done. You're not doing it. And then it's often too. We go to the general assembly. We need this done. Would you help fund it? So um, not we agents, but the the message is brought mm -hmm. forth based on local need. And so people will advocate for what's important to them. And, and this has been a critical part of the American story for how long now? Hundreds of years. Yeah. So uh, yeah, we're looking into the 1800s. I should quote you the exact year. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> middle, middle, middle 1800s is, is close enough. Yes. And so Smith Lever. Mm -hmm. And on and on and, and additional after that. And then the 1890s, which were the university set aside just for black students. And today that University of Virginia State still exists, but we're together with Virginia Tech is in our two land grants here in Virginia. And, and that, that uh, 1890 was in a Southern state. You wouldn't find that in a Northern state. So all the Southern states who had a poor record of addressing the needs of African-American students, they had 1890s placed there. And so, they're still there today, and not just for people of color, but for all of those that can qualify to get in. And uh, here in Virginia, we work together and we have different roles in terms of special specialization. And uh, it's, uh, it's very important that we listen to the people's needs and then we respond back and make that part of what we're doing and delivering on facts. And you mentioned your experience growing up with a garden. Master Gardener is a major program uh, across the United States, teaching people about vegetable, fruit, other forms of, of horticultural practice, helping people identify issues that pop up with, uh, with the, the plants. In Oregon, every once in a while, they have uh, identify the apple kind of thing because there are so many old varieties around or, or people bought a piece of property and they don't know what they have. And you can go in and people will help you with that kind of information and it's free. And that's another cornerstone. The, the master gardeners are a strong, strong group of volunteers. So volunteers expand our reach. They make us uh, more effective in getting the word out. And they also give us feedback. You're you need to do this. Uh, this is important to us. Why are we not doing this? So mm -hmm. these volunteers uh, expand the reach of local extension agents and they make us uh, accountable. And Master Gardeners are one of those groups that's organized into an organization. They, they have state and local associations, they have officers, they have meetings, educational programs, uh, 
we we have a strong group here across several counties the rapidan river master gardeners and at the carver center well, a pet project that's reaching its um, it's jumping off point the master gardeners are busy growing vegetables there educating teaching and demonstrating how others can learn from their example and and, and again i i something like that i think is free or very low cost yes um so we're we're in a cost recovery mindset in extension but that doesn't mean we charge for everything that has a cost so master gardener college is a good example they'll charge a fee to participate in that college but it's 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 basically cost recovery entirely master gardeners receive training and it's at significant cost it can be a hundred dollars for the training but that's two dollars an hour for the time that they spend there's consumables there are you know a lot of printing and notebooks and resources that go into it so 100 bucks is a lot of money but it ends up being two dollars an hour for the time they spend in the classroom okay and and other uh, questions can be answered by again people who are trained or if it exceeds their knowledge then they can tap into expertise further yeah, up. absolutely and the best thing you can say as an extension agent is i don't know and then but then you find out so uh, you have to remember to get back to somebody. Mm -hmm. But we're tempted to, to tell them something. But the best thing you can say is, you know, I don't know. Mm. Yeah, indeed. Um, I, I remember a very important lesson along that line, which I can share with you at some point. But um, it, are there similar things from the animal side to the master gardener? Yeah, actually, there's a master cattleman's training. I'm not sure that they've developed an organization as um, volunteers like master gardeners have, but there is a master cattleman's training, a certification that they can get, and uh, a credential that at least they're proud of, but I think more than that, information they can use to improve their situation. And I challenge those that I have scholarship into that class I challenge when I look, your job is to share what you've learned with others. So to pass it on. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, do you, does Virginia have a, a sort of a master grazer or a grazing school or something like that? So th there's not a master grazer that I'm aware of. It might exist in some other form or fashion, but there are certainly grazing schools. And so Virginia Cooperative Extension is is heavily involved in the Virginia Forage and Grassland Council and that's where the grazing schools come out of from the scientists and the specialists and the agents and the farmers that put together a grazing school on a farm hands-on learning experiences seen you look you, you allocate some grass the next day you go back and look well I didn't do my calculation right it wasn't enough you know or they, it was too much and mm -hmm. so grazing schools have been held in many counties across Virginia. They've been led by extension expertise. They've been sponsored by and promoted by Virginia Forage and Grassland Council. And together they've made a big difference and it's grazing is, uh, is, a, is more prominent now. And so you think, well, I'm grazing. Well, grazing, the way I use that word is an intentional use. It's an intended uh, intensity uh, attention to it rather than just pasturing. Well, I'm, I'm grazing my pasture. Aren't I grazing? Well, maybe not. So uh, you have to make decisions rather than let the animals make decisions. Kind of the difference between fishing and catching fish. Um, there you go. <laughs> Drowning worms versus reeling one in. Um, but indeed, the management, we have a lot of tools that we didn't have, say, you know, 40, 50 years ago. Um, and clearly we have a lot of experience. A lot of people have gained experience doing this. And so it's not quite as radical as it was perhaps in 1985 when you were trying to talk to people about it. Sure, exactly. And so it's driven, my interest is driven in it by the economics. So how can we be more profitable? All you have to do is look around a farm at where the money is and the money's in the equipment. So if you can have less equipment and let animals do more of the work, I think Jim Garrish alluded to this, you know, his job description of a cow, she needs to be producing a calf for me and working for me and 
it's not giving me trouble. And so these are all related to her grazing and, and making a living on grass. And so economics are, are better when they graze to a point. So you can maximize grazing. You can never feed hay for 15 years like that manager, but he could have run more cattle, fed some hay and had smaller nets, but more of them and total net would have been higher. Mm. So it took me a little while to learn that lesson. And in fact, I argued with the author of some of that factual information, Greg Halleck in Kentucky. And he was talking about that maximum grazing was not maximum profit. It was maximum for the environment, but it was not maximum for economics. And I didn't understand that lesson at that time, but I do now. Hmm. So, okay, let's spend a little time on that. I, I've I've had the image of you know the the railroad where you have these levers that you can switch tracks, and and so the farmer has three levers that he can pull on. One is to increase yield per acre. Mm-hmm. One is to increase what he gets paid for his product, and then the third, and I think in my mind, most powerful is the cost of his production. And, and so am, am I okay so far in that? You are. And uh, Kevin DeVetter at Kansas State described the, the indicators of profitable beef producers. And we can all easily uh, get to the point of the biggest producers possibly being among those. They've got a lot of advantages. They sell the biggest loads, the highest value loads, they, they buy in the, at the cheapest prices, they buy in volume, they sell in volume, they have all these huge advantages and they can make hay work because they produce it at the cheapest cost. But the small producer can compete even with those big ones. If he's grazing and the big one's feeding hay, the small producer has an advantage and it's the only advantage he's got compared to a big producer, his only advantage. He can't sell trader load lots of value added cattle he can add value to his cattle, but they're going to be in groups of three, four, five, or 10, not, not a 50,000 pound load. So the competitive advantage of the small producer is almost only in controlling his biggest cost, which is stored feed. So mm. feed some hay, but reduce it and uh, keep have less equipment in the shed and try to keep those cows working more days of the year. So what's it cost to put up hay a ton, just as a kind of estimate? More than most people want to want to admit. It's it's north of $200 a ton, and mm. they'll argue with you a little bit on that. But it, if you count all costs, it is, it, is, it is a phenomenal expense. And so you can almost always buy it cheaper than you can make it. And so we hope that the round bale operators keep doing that so that those little ones like myself can go out and buy hay, good hay, at a reasonable price for the seller and a reasonable price for the buyer, but they shouldn't be selling it for $125 a ton. Mm. Uh, there's $50, $75 worth of fertilizer in every ton of hay. So you can buy some hay just for the price of the fertilizer that's in it. And that's well, not good that, business. Uh, it, it, it's important for the receiver to recognize that when it comes to feeding it, because you want that fertility um, you want to capture that to benefit you. Um, I've, I've in the past been known to say, you know, don't think of it as spending $200 a ton to make hay. Think of it as spending $200 a ton to decrease the feed value of an already over mature forage. And, you know, there's some great hay made, but most of the hay is not as good as the grass that we stockpile in the fall, Peter. And we've talked about that over and over and over again. It's, it's not very hard to have have stockpiled grass at Christmas time. It's better than most of the hay that's in the barn. Mm-hmm. And and now that's your part of the world in, in that part of Virginia that you can do that. But that, again, is is taking advantage of the opportunities it's also why we shouldn't be trying to apply you know sort of blanket statements across the cattle industry in the united states let alone overseas one advantage that a small producer in your part of the world might have over say a large producer in nebraska is access to markets directly um, the opportunity to do those kinds of sales and and the folks that can get a retail package of meat together, whether it's lamb, pork, chicken, or beef, 
They are selling all that retail meat that they can produce. Now, is it profitable? I don't know. Uh, they've got to, they can't compete with the grocery store. If you sell beef at the price that Walmart's taken, they'll break you because mm -hmm. it's a you know, huge system that they're working off of. And so we've got to get a value, whether it's personal connection to the production, whether it's a belief in how the meat is raised, how the animal's life is, whether it's just a, a, a connection with the consumer, uh, they've got to charge more. And we, I see these $2 a dozen eggs. And I go, Lord, they're getting killed with, you know, it's got to be $4 or $5. I mean, mm -hmm. it certainly don't price off of 69 cents a dozen, the lost leader for the week. Mm. And so they just have to help their customers understand, I don't have any of those kind of eggs. I've got mine. And here's why they're worth $4. Mm -hmm. So, uh, again, we, we said $200 a ton in the cost. I, I remember that it, one of the, if you want to start an argument in an extension meeting, put up an enterprise spreadsheet. Right. <laughs> and, and the, you know, it, it, that's not what it costs me. Well, maybe, right. maybe not. But um, have, have you gone through the exercise of looking and, and, and costing these things out? Um, so... The you you mentioned the Virginia Forage and Grassland Council. Um, again, people who are interested in grassland forage agriculture in your part of the state um, should contact or get in in touch with the the Virginia Forage and Grassland Council. And VFGC is one of the most successful ag education programs in Virginia. And uh, again, I'll give Extension credit for being a big part of that that outfit. But I'll give its organizational structure credit as well for being smart and offering high value um, turning point information, something that people would pay for. And uh, Virginia is an affiliate of the American Forage and Grassland Council, and these affiliates are in some 25 states across the country. Uh, Florida is the latest one, and we know about that, and we're really pleased to see that, that happening. Um, we don't have an affiliate in Texas. We'd like to have one there for Texas listeners, and it'd be a good place to start a forage council. But um, it's education. Farmers are just looking for that. The good ones are constantly wanting to learn something new. And attendance at these VFGC meetings is in the hundreds at four locations across the state. They held their first virtual set of conferences and actually increased attendance. Hmm. So hmm. I think most virtual stuff worked that way. A lot of it did. And uh, so education and facts and good, reliable information. And full disclosure, you're a previous officer in the American Forage and Grassland Council. I'm a current officer. We've known each other for a while. Like I said, we're not going to say how long. Um, it's, it's been... I think an important part of my experience as, as someone related in, in forage agriculture, but you don't, so a unique aspect of both the VFGC and other affiliates and the AFGC is the membership, as you mentioned before, people from public institutions that can be universities or agencies, uh, private businesses, and then producers. And, yep. and trying to get equal voices from yep. the three. But people could become involved in it without necessarily being one of those three to learn uh, to support. Absolutely, sure. And I'm, I feel certain that there are attendees at these meetings that may not even have a stake in the, in the race, but they're curious. They, they're interested in this discussion and they want to learn more. And so that's good. You know, for citizens in general to understand agriculture is a big plus. So I tell farmers that when they get a new neighbor, make a neighbor out of them. Mm. Go over there and welcome them and push their snow and take them some sweet corn and say, you know, tomorrow we're going to be making noise and I hope you can uh, tolerate it. So instead of just saying, well, I don't have to do that, uh, let's let's inform our neighbors. And when you when you recruit them and bring them along, they'll They'll tolerate. So, well, Johnny's over there making a little noise tonight, you know, making dust and lights are shining and he's farming. So we need him to farm. Hmm. Well, we'd rather have him as a neighbor than some That's other right. uh, other right. possibility. He's occupying um, the land. 
Well, and also if you're a member of the community and you're engaged in some other things, then you rub elbows with people there. And again, it's just better for us to get, come together um, and anything that can help us with that. Um, you mentioned already someone who was your mentor. I just like to pay homage to those people that were doing this kind of work when we got here and, and the people that influenced them. I mean, there's, there is a, a, a tree of, you know, academic oh, or yeah. extension people or others that stretches back quite a long way. So, um, who are some of those mm -hmm. in the Virginia area? Harlan White and Scott Carr and Vivian Allen and Dale Wolf, they were all forage people. Virginia had a real deep bench in forages, and they still have good people in forages, but those were the ones that, that, that formed my ideas and helped me take messages out to farmers and feel like I had footing in the subject area. Mm -hmm. So... You've you've you mentioned this. Uh, we've talked about the changes that you've seen, um, and you mentioned your concern about going forward. Are there some things that kind of give you hope right now? Yeah, I think uh, I think we're at a we're in a in a decade of equality. I think we're learning from our mistakes in this country and. Mm -hmm. We've, we've been working on equality for a long, long time, and we haven't made as much progress as we should, but I, I'm optimistic that we're going to make more progress. And for those that deserve better equality, maybe it's not fast enough, but I'm optimistic that we're in a decade of equality. I certainly see it here in Virginia, and I am optimistic that it can happen across the country. So uh, if we can put ourselves in the shoes of others, we'll, we'll understand that equality piece pretty well. And I even have trouble with it, even though I'm working at it. Um, I ask somebody who's doesn't look like me to be patient, and you know they've been patient. <laughs> so um, I shouldn't ask them to be patient. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, we were in an extension um, meeting, and the the leader of the discussion said, "Well, how are we going to make changes? We've got to change our behavior." You know, and mm -hmm. she she reported out that she thought that was rather uh, she, she found it to be interesting, but it, it, that's just the bottom line. If you want things to change, you've got to change your behavior. Well, right. Become the change you'd like to that's see, true. I think, is one aspect. Um, and at the same time, I think that um, I, my perspective has been lately looking more and more overseas. And, and it, it's not to ignore. That's not the point. The point is that when the, the statistics about the need for animal source food and human diets globally and the lack of it and what that means, and then looking forward into the near and longer term future, um, what could be appropriately leveraged from different parts of the world to help improve productivity and efficiency and and drive sustainable development through livestock agriculture. And, and these ruminant animals, Peter, that ruminant animal is so special and unique to that. So humans and pigs have the same gut. It's a monogastric system and uh, we need some dense ingredients to get along. You know, we can eat some salad and the pig can graze, but uh, they need something that's got some calories in it, but a cow she or a goat, they make their living off of something we would die eating. Mm -hmm. so, Literally. And they turn it into something we can use, milk and leather and meat and all kinds of other things that we take for granted every day. And, yeah. and, and so, more as monogastrics, we need specific nutrients, specific oh, yeah. amino acids yeah. in digestible forms yeah. that, again, the ruminant can take even non-protein nitrogen oh, yeah. and upcycle it. And I was just doing some figures um, for some other uh, activity. And if you look at in the United States, it's something like 2.6. The figures were in kilograms, but I can't imagine they're not just convertible. 2.6 kilograms of concentrate grain life cycle to produce a kilogram of carcass weight in beef. That's the U.S. sort of average over the entire life 
two point six to one. Mm -hmm. The reason can, it's that low is because of grazing. Exactly. And well, we put and, some grain into them on the end, but with grazing, we can dilute that number down across the life cycle and, to a, and a the, very doable number. And if we assume that's all corn, mostly, which, um, that corn rep and that represents the only human utilizable input into that life cycle. Right. And, and so you can look up what the lysine content of corn is and the standardized ileal digestibility of that lysine is in swine and get an estimate for the amount of human utilizable lysine in, and then you can estimate the human utilizable lysine out in terms of beef. Mm -hmm. And it's over 225% increase. And lysine tends to be the limiting nutrient in humanity's diet globally um, when it comes to amino acid nutrition. Um, and there was just recently a paper that came out where the estimates are out of 200 and some odd um, countries and territories in the world, 103 aren't meeting intake targets. Mm -hmm. And and part of the, the confusion is people look at protein and they don't realize that's crude protein. <laughs> right. And so, yeah, people are, are accounting for crude protein and thinking that that has any value in human nutrition. So we, there, there's there's information we need to get better at, at at talking to people about it, and then I think that that also then helps us make the case for ruminant animal agriculture sure. um, being essential in increasing wait, wait. and upcycling. We, sorry, we beat up animal agriculture over fat and cholesterol, and we both learned from a Dale Height uh, human nutritionist, uh, North Carolina State, that. The fat is not as bad as the starch and the sugar. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if you're chasing omega-3s, and that's a healthy part of fat, we might say the first place to look would be grass-fed beef, but it's actually wild-caught salmon. But even the grain-fed beef has got, since it's got extra fat from being fed, omega-3s are in there and they're, they're a part of that, that extra fat. So you can get about as much omega-3s from a grain-fed animal as you can a grass-fed one because of the extra fat in the in the grain fed animal. And that's from a research study quoted to me by an animal scientist at Virginia Tech who was concerned that I was thinking grass fed was better. Mm -hmm. So anyway, yeah. uh, we need to get the facts and uh, the, the folks that make up that food guide pyramid, Peter, we, we know that sometimes they have an ax to grind, right? They wanna sell something, follow the money. Mm -hmm. So we made eggs bad and we made milk fat bad and we made other fats bad and meats bad and uh, actually it's not as bad as it was made out to be but you know we don't want to eat butter by the stick but butter's better than margarine by a long shot but look what happened margarine took over because it's supposed to be better but it's actually worse and it was recommended by that same bunch that built the pyramid mm -hmm. <laughs> they the wanted Egyptians. to sell something oh yeah <laughs> Um, yes. Well, that's okay. We can preach to each other, brother, because um, you know that we're we're both reading from the same hymnal. Um, and I, I think that that's a critical part of it as well. And the challenge, of course, is that um, the the influences are the funding. And and so I think Jimmy Henning made the comment that if people are interested. Uh, one of the things that they can do is they can get involved in their local extension um, uh, planning or, or committee, mm -hmm. uh, advisory committee, mm -hmm. and, and just start asking questions about various topics of interest and, and where is this information coming from and why, mm -hmm. you know, why is it not reflecting the current science? And, and one of the things that I'm more than happy to do is to share rep resources so that people have that information. Um, and um, I guess I kept you almost an hour and I'm really grateful for your time. I, I always enjoy having a chance to visit with you. Haven't been able to do that for a few months now. Um, although we did get together in, in Savannah, which was very, very nice. Um, that felt like 
I, I was escaping to to get on a plane and fly across the country for the first time in over you know, almost a year. Um, but what um, what kind of books does Carl like to read? What are you reading lately? You know, I, I finished the book White Fragility and had a little debate with my daughter about its contents, and she's she and so the debate is good to help you find the truth. She said, well, you need to read some more on this, that subject, because that's not the only source. So I appreciate that. I was citing what I had learned from that. And uh, anyway, we're pretty privileged. To, you and I are born white males, and we didn't earn what we've got, Peter. Mm -hmm. We didn't earn it. We just were born with it. Mm -hmm. And so we've got these rights and, and considerations that are given to us simply because of the way we look. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's one part i'm also reading a book that's about this uh these these nomads and it's called nomad land and they're they're basically 60 and up traveling the country for 10 15 an hour work temporary living out of a van or an rv or a converted panel truck and uh they can't do any better a lot of them are citing their problems back to the last uh, recession and it broke them Maybe they were on the margin and it was what tipped it for them. But it's a phenomenal group of people that are traveling the country. Um, they are, um, I guess they'd be classified as homeless. I know some folks that have, have lived without a home, but they were doing it voluntarily. A lot of these in this book say they are. Um, the interesting part is, is that they're mostly white. So why mostly white? Because you can encounter the police out there when you're, not living in a house and the police don't treat us all the same. We don't get the consideration that a white male would get if you're a, a person of color. So that's one explanation in the book why, why there are, aren't more people of color living the way the folks are that I described. Um, I read the book Hamilton and that's a, it's a, it's a, it's like a big dictionary, but I learned a lot of history. And the fellow's a writer because they included a lot of his writing in that book. And it was, I, it was a, I had to keep at it. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, Washington would have never been the man he was without Hamilton. Never. Mm -hmm. So he was, are you allowed to a, say that? Are you allowed to say that in Virginia? I just said it. <laughs> 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 He'd never been what he was without Hamilton. Good, good, good on you. Good on you. Um, so, any questions you have for me, Carl? Yeah. Um, so you, I'm, I'm advertising my Grace 300 program with my shirt and the, the poster in the background. And it's about uh, approximately grazing 300 days a year and seeing that as a higher net position than year-round grazing or, or uh, feeding hay from Thanksgiving to Easter. <laughs> and so I, I see 300 cropping up in different places. And I'm a, I'm a sensitive to that. I'm, I'm attentive to that use because I'm interested to know if it's coming from any one place. So Arkansas has got a 300 days of grazing program. Mm. And I look real close to see when they first started that. And we started here in Virginia, March, 2005. And uh, anyway, uh, Barenbrug, you had mentioned something about 300 days. And I'm like, where'd that come from? Any idea? Did you notice that in any of the the advertisements that you all made? There was a 300 yeah. statement. I it's a nice that, round number. Anybody yeah. could pick it. That's what I did. I just picked it because it's a nice round number. Well, I, I one, it's it's exactly that. Two, it would represent a significant improvement for the average cattleman across the United States. The idea that people on average feed hay the same amount of time, whether they're in Mississippi or in uh, Minnesota is, I, I still don't understand. Um, but, and I think that that figure is somewhere closer to five months out of the year. Um, I know that when Baron Brug began looking at how to talk about building calendars of feed supply and, and using maybe some annuals or some other uh, perennial forages beyond your base forage or how to extend that base with things like stockpile grazing. Um, we were looking and seeing that, yes, Arkansas, somebody had a 305 days somewhere in there. Um, I think that, that there was um, some others 
doing similar things. So it was uh, kind of leveraging what was already being spoken about. Um, and I, I don't know that Amazing Grazing has ever talked about a specific days. days. Yeah. That's uh, North Tennis Carolina yep. for our ten Tennessee Matt has Poor. one. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, Tennessee has... John Jennings a, in Arkansas. Yeah. We give him mm -hmm. credit. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, um, Gary Bates in Tennessee. Absolutely. Um, I don't know Dennis Hancock before he left Georgia, but they were talking about a grazing program in Georgia. Mm -hmm. So Barenbrook was looking at what was already in place and then talking about that as a as an idea and a goal. Cool. Well, I, I just give Virginia Tech credit for recognizing a good thing and they granted to this educational program I'm telling you about, Grace 300 Virginia, uh, a, a good sized grant to do training for agents and other professionals in Virginia. So the College of Agriculture Strategic Initiatives and Competitive Grants uh, granted us a, a good sized team, a, a nice chunk of money to do a training program. And uh, we just give them credit for seeing that it was worth doing and that a county agent can be part of what's mostly dominated by professors on campus. So we've got some professors on our team, so I'll give them credit for pulling their share of the load. Excellent. Well, Carl, I want to thank you again for your time. Our guest today has been Carl Stafford, uh, livestock, forage, extension agent, Culpeper County, uh, Virginia Extension Service, um, and I'd like to count you as a friend, colleague, um, and yeah, all the best and hope to be able to see you here shortly. Yes. Thank you, Peter.